you know, one of the things that comes up frequently, uh, when the, you know, is this whole question of uh, different kinds of uh, ET life forms. And uh, many people will ask, well, gee, are they all humanoid? And they don't really use that term properly. So I want to do some definitions first. The, uh, the, the, the ET life forms that our contact groups have experienced and seen and, uh, as you're going to hear about, photographed, are all humanoid in the sense that they are two arms, two legs, a head, and a torso, uh, and are upright. And this seems to be a morphogenic field, uh, as Rupert Sheldrake would call it, where uh, apparently the universal concept of man, and by man I don't mean the gender male, but man as in a universal symbol, the kind of symbol that Leonardo da Vinci put inside a circle, uh, that showed man, that uh, is like a five-pointed star. If you look at a five-pointed star, you've got a head on top, two arms, two legs, and that's considered the most sacred universal symbol, by the way, is the five-pointed star for that reason. And I think that this is a universal morphogenic field that works, and once, uh, according to the, the Rupert Sheldrake's morphogenic field theory, is that because the whole cosmos is awake, and because the whole universe is a, a conscious quantum hologram where the fullness of intelligence is present at every point in space and time, that when a certain pattern begins to evolve and work, it then gets replicated at remote places without any linear contact. It's sort of like the hundredth monkey phenomenon where uh, an island with a group of monkeys learn a new social skill uh, or uh, hunting skill or what have you, and they will find that at the same time a group of monkeys on another island that had no direct contact begin doing the same thing, that there's this sort of collective, great, uh, conscious, integrating uh, switchboard in, rea in existence that integrates everything happening, and that when something works, it replicates and is used at remote places. And it seems that higher intelligent life forms, rather than being, you know, like a circular jellyfish or what have you, uh, tend to be these humanoid in shape. Now, what's interesting is that what we've experienced, and I have also heard this from uh, people who've worked in classified projects that have been present at the retrieval of extraterrestrial bodies when we have um, unfortunately shot uh, down using electromagnetic weapons some of these spacecraft, that the, the bodies that are retrieved may be very small or very tall or you know, various skin colors or even types of skin and various facial structures and hairless or with hair, but that they all are humanoid. They have a head, two arms, two legs. So when I say humanoid, I don't mean human-like. I mean that morphology, that shape. So I wanted to get that definition out there because many times people will say, well, was the ET humanoid? And they mean looking just like a human, and that is not what humanoid means. So, um, uh, so let's, definitional uh, requirements are very important so we know we're speaking the same language. So when I say humanoid, I just mean an, a head, two arms, two legs, a torso. Now, within that, there's enormous variation. Uh, one of the... Uh, disclosure Project witnesses uh, back in the 90s uh, had told me that they had learned that there were uh, several dozen different planetary species that over the years had been cataloged uh, in classified projects that dealt with retrieval of uh, extraterrestrial vehicles and, and in studying this issue. And of course, you know, in the pop culture, everyone thinks of the big bug-eyed greys or the reptilians, which of course ironically are the ones that are man-made program life forms that are uh, genetically uh, created creatures and uh, many people that have worked in those projects have come forward to, to describe to us exactly how that's done. So the irony is that the public perception of ET is actually the disinformation man-made image and the actual ETs that have been retrieved aren't very much like that, although there are a couple species that might roughly fit into the shape and size of what might be called quote-unquote a gray or what have you, but that they are more than just that. There's a whole range of beings, uh, and some of them obviously have descended from different types of uh, uh, 
certain creatures to begin with. For example, and this is where this conversation gets very interesting from a from a you know, anthro pathological point of view and then trying to extrapolate that to what we know from extraterrestrial studies both with what we've done and also in classified projects with the some you know 550 military and uh, intelligence and corporate people that I have spoken with and interviewed over the years and what I have found is that while we there's no doubt that humans now I'm not saying humanoids but homo sapiens humans have descended from or certainly have a genetic shared root with primates. Uh, we have 98 or 98 and a half, depending on who you read, uh, percent. Uh, so some 98 percent of our genetic code is identical to a chimpanzee or a gorilla. Now, that's a lot, but still, that 2 percent is also a lot. Um, and uh, and that is is the big question of a where has how did the two percent come about? Uh, was it all purely evolutional, or was there also some intervention? Uh, I think it's both. And uh, secondly, what does it mean that Homo sapiens have descended from uh, primates? And I think that the primate studies that are being done around the world. Uh, pioneered by people like Jane Goodall and others, but more recent studies that have been done are very interesting because what's being found, uh, although some people uh, don't like hearing this because they always have this idea of, quote-unquote, the noble savage, is that uh, the many primate species uh, organize not only into tribes, but engage in intertribal violence. And, uh, in fact... It has been recorded that uh, chimpanzees and others have organized into uh, warfare. Now, it's been pointed out that that may be due to the stress of a shrinking habitat and uh, things that are being uh, imposed upon their environment by humans. But nevertheless, the question becomes that uh, the facts are what they are, and that is, that primates are noted to kill each other. <laughs> now, what, what's also interesting when you look at that, uh, because this is what the, the bane of human existence, is, is prejudice and fear of people who are different from us, and, of course, various forms of racism and misogyny and uh, uh, bigotry and uh, separation and what have you that has led to organized warfare around various uh, differentiating qualities, whether it be skin color or religion or ethnicity or what have you. Um, but that there is a root for that within humanity that has to be transcended that is probably uh, carried over from our uh, connection to uh, our very roots um, as 98% being identical with primates. And this, of course, is always the big question of our overcoming some of the aspects of humans that are uh, within all of us and that we have to overcome and control and find ways to resolve that are nonviolent and doesn't result in massive warfare now that we're in the era of weapons of mass destruction. So this is a very, very interesting discussion. And there have been, of course, many books written on this issue. Now, if you look at this, though, in terms of other phyla um, of animals, let's take, for example, uh, canines. Well, dogs, for example, and wolves. Now, it's interesting, because years ago when I was in college, I read a very interesting book uh, about wolves and about and how maligned they were. And, of course, many people say, oh, my God, that person's like a wolf and this and that. But in that reality, wolves don't kill each other. They may have a pecking order with an alpha wolf and an omega wolf and a beta wolf, but and they may uh, attack an intruding wolf just to teach it a lesson, but actually they don't go to the point of killing each other, whereas the doves, the dove of peace, will peck each other to death. So what's interesting is that even within the human uh, sort of prejudice of other species, there is this tendency to uh, assume that wolves are uh, violent and doves are not. 
when in reality doves have been known to be so territorial as to kill each other, their own kind, whereas wolves do not do so. So should it be the wolf of peace instead of the dove of peace? It's very interesting. Now, <laughs> I throw out these issues not just because I tend to be a bit of a contrarian <laughs> in terms of what conventional wisdom in society is saying, but also to bring up this question of what does it mean that there are civilizations from other planetary systems I have been informed that have evolved from uh, a lineage for which there's no concept of violence amongst themselves um, and or the concept of warfare very interesting question you know one thing that I'd like to interject here is that people might be thinking well um, you know wolves do kill prey you know so do cetaceans kill their prey and sometimes they even act together in groups or packs to attack their prey, but but that's a whole different thing. That is not warfare. That's eating, and they happen to be predators, and that's their food. Right, so right. it that's is a, a very different deal. You, every every living animal eats something, even if it's a plant. And of course, they found that plants have a certain consciousness about them. Although I think it's certainly more grievous to kill a higher intelligent animal than a uh, than a carrot. Nevertheless, um, the question is. Uh, your point is exactly correct that, that you know, many animals will uh, organize into uh, hunting packs to feed themselves to survive, but it isn't done for the sake of killing. It's to survive. And, and as opposed to territorialism where there's murder or organized warfare within the species, which humans do, and also, quite interestingly, it's now being established that primates do. Uh, even if there are environmental stressors that have led to that, that's beside the point. They still engage in that. Whereas you don't see that. I mean, you don't see dolphins uh, killing each other. You don't see uh, other, many other species doing this. And so we know that this is part of the real challenge of humanity is to transcend into a higher state of spiritual awareness to control those um, proclivities so we don't engage in not only murder of people, uh, which as an emergency doctor I used to see with great, great frequency in the ER under the most ridiculous circumstances people would come in having been murdered or severely attacked and then subsequently die for the most trivial reasons. But also you see nation states and city states uh, and tribes going back many thousands of years organizing into organized murder, which is, of course, warfare. And I think that uh, we have to understand that there are civilizations that exist that are interstellar, that have evolved from lineages that don't have that concept at all, in the least. Now, of course, everyone gets trapped into Star Trek and Star Wars and uh, whatever the movie du jour is, where it's one rampaging Klingon after another fighting each other. But that's much more of an anthropocentric projection, where we're projecting our own baggage, as it were, onto into space than the apparent order that's out there. And uh, I think that we have to take a look in the mirror. In fact, I think that it's very interesting that a lot of the way people will assume uh, that our interstellar extraterrestrial visitors uh, are, are violent is, is much more of a statement about ourselves. And it's basically the way people regard this entire subject, I think it's a giant, not only a Rorschach test, but a big mirror that reflects more about what the person is about than what is actually being intended. Because obviously, if you go through an analysis of this, any civilization capable of going faster than the speed of light, dematerializing at one point in space and rematerializing light years or galaxies away at another place like Earth, their technologies are so advanced that if they were inclined to weaponize them and be hostile towards, say, a planet like ours that's beginning to go into space with weapons and has killed almost 200 million of our own people in organized warfare in the last hundred years alone, that doesn't count the murders, the individual murders that have happened, that 
that such species who have that capability, if they were truly hostile, would have used that proclivity with that technology, and we wouldn't be breathing the freer of Earth today, 60 years after the dawn of the nuclear era. So I think that one of the interesting things, though, is to consider uh, the fact that, that in our Sea City expeditions and also in interviews I have done with classified military um, personnel who have dealt with uh, retrieved extraterrestrial uh, vehicles and bodies is that some of these species appear to have descended from, uh, for example, what we would call bird-like creatures that become, instead of flying, are two-legged, two-arm, and a head, but are kind of feathery. Others have encountered ones that appear to have a cetacean sort of quality to them or a dolphin-like quality. Others have in, 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 encountered some that appear to be almost like a, a, a two-arm, two-leg, and a head praying mantis type uh, uh, intelligent life form that are apparently incredibly intelligent and very gentle, but to someone who would have insect phobia would be kind of freaked out, um, and et cetera and so on. And so I think that there is the possibility that almost any phyla uh, and any type of animal, uh, in our case, of course, it was you know primates and what have you, could evolve and have uh, perhaps some augmentation of their development through some sort of mysterious intervention that would lead to an upright man or humanoid that would be from that lineage. That, In other words, we have a primate connection. Others could have a canine connection or a, a cetacean connection or a, a bird-like uh, pathway or some other pathway. Of course, it doesn't exist on this planet, but that is a type of animal life or life form that would evolve on other planets. And with that would bring their own qualities and attributes. Um, and I think that uh, uh, any of them, of course, you, one could make the argument, might have some of the same uh, problems humans have controlling their tendency towards violence, but the likelihood of them traveling interstellar uh, with the level of technology that that implies, which we'll get to in a moment, and remaining in a state of unchecked proclivities. In other words, it's one thing to have an, a capacity for violence, but if it's unchecked to the point of aggression and hostility, it, it's almost inconceivable, inconceivable that, that a life form would be able to not have blown itself up or encountered other life forms and blown themselves up uh, long before they would get out of their own solar system uh, because there appears to be very much a cosmic order and a universal order where evolving planets are observed as Earth is being observed. And, you know, there's a certain um, litmus test, a certain uh, development in social consciousness and spiritual consciousness that's required before you're let out of your planet very far. I mean, obviously, we did go to the moon, contrary to some conspiracy theorists. Uh, it was the, the footage was hoax, but we, in fact, did go to the moon. Um, but... It isn't as if we're allowed to fly amongst the stars willy-nilly while we're still in the process of uh, engaging in warfare on this planet uh, as, as humans. And so I have called this the cosmic quarantine that appears to exist around any planet that has not yet become peaceful. And uh, I have this on very good intelligence from people who have worked in uh, the National Reconnaissance Office and the Defense Intelligence Agency who have told me of uh, our attempts to use some very esoteric things that fly, the man-made uh, UFOs, as it were, the alien reproduction vehicles, to go out into space where we have been not only tracked but at times turned away. And I'll never forget uh, a meeting I had with a an analyst at the Defense Intelligence Agency who back, I believe, in the 70s was um, analyzing various uh, photographs that were from satellites. And some of these photographs had pictures of ET spacecraft in them between where the satellite was in space and the Earth. But he also discovered that some of the satellites were turned 
away from Earth. We're not looking at the Soviet Union or China or someplace, but they were looking out into space. And he asked, what are these satellites imaging, going looking away from the planet? And he was told they were looking for extraterrestrial vehicles and that some of these had become developed enough that they were targeting and tracking and targeting ET craft in a certain sector of space. And that whenever they would try to do that, those satellite systems would be jammed and, and switched off or disabled by the ETs. And this was causing some consternation and aggravation within these sort of classified projects. Uh, I've heard this from more than one person, so I have high confidence that those sort of things have happened. And it isn't that the ETs were hostile, but they were not going to allow uh, us to weaponize space to such an extent that this could really get out of control. And so uh, I think this has created a great deal of tension, by the way, because we have managed the relationship between humans and these extraterrestrial civilizations very poorly because it's all been through the lens of a sort of military defense posture rather than understanding why they might be here and that perhaps the concern that exists in the cosmos is that humans have gone from horse and buggies and and uh, rifles in the last hundred years or so to uh, space travel and hydrogen bombs and, and, and even more esoteric weapons in classified projects that are electromagnetic in nature and so-called scalar or longitudinal weapons. So I think that uh, we really have to look at this, and this is why we really do need to form uh, a council of wise elders on this planet to be involved in uh, this whole question of interplanetary relations and looking at it in a much broader way than sort of a knee-jerk, reactionary, military response, um, understanding that we do have these proclivities and that uh, obviously, if civilizations had the capacity to travel faster than the speed of light from one star system to this star system and to Earth, the likelihood that they would be hostile towards humanity and Earth, uh, given the fact that we've been targeting them, we have downed dozens of these spacecraft, we have gone into space uh, illegally within the classified world uh, with weapons, Etc. and so on, that, you know, if they had an intent that was hostile, it would have been point, set, match, and done with about 1945 when we detonated the first atomic weapon at, uh, uh, at the Trinity site so in, in New Mexico. And I think this is why people need to think about this in a very broad view, is that while we, you know, you can't prove a negative. Many people say, well, can you prove that they're not? I said, well... <laughs> You can never prove a negative, it's axiomatic, but what we can establish is that the Earth has not been attacked and invaded by these civilizations. On the other hand, we can prove that we have attacked them. So there is a certainly a higher level of restraint and consciousness operating there because with the technologies that they have at their disposal, if they wanted to kick the living daylights out of us, they could have done so and have not. And I think this is not only one of the surest proofs that <laughs> that we're dealing with very developed societies uh, that are in a, a higher level of social and spiritual awareness than we've yet attained collectively on Earth, but that we need to have people analyzing this whole situation with uh, calmer minds than have been allowed to because the people who have been allowed in the, the very small tent of these classified projects has been a self-selecting group of militarists and, uh, frankly, warmongers. And I think this is something we really need to correct.